So minimalism is really editing. It's really saying no, and it's knowing what you're saying no to. And that's a really good way to reverse engineer getting to your life purpose. Welcome to Champions Mojo Weekly Podcast, where your hosts Kelly Palace and Maria Parker share with you what it takes to be a champion. Kelly is a former Division I head swim coach, Olympic trials qualifier, and holds Masters World and National Swimming Records, and Maria holds world records in endurance cycling, and was the overall women's winner of the world's toughest bike race, Race Across America. They'll be sharing their personal stories and wisdom, along with interviewing other champions to give you the tools you need for becoming a true champion in your own life. And now, your host, Kelly Palace. Hello, friends. Welcome to the Champions Mojo Podcast. What a better topic for the last day of the year than simplifying your life. When I hear those words, simplify your life, they sound mystical, magical, like something I could do someday, <laughs> some way, but I'm just not sure how. Well, today you will be getting five great tips to do just that simplify your life. We are extremely fortunate to have as our guest an expert on this topic, and that person is Genevieve Parker Hill. She's the author of two books on the subject, the first an Amazon bestseller entitled Minimalist Living, Decluttering for Joy, Health, and Creativity, and a second upcoming book called Experience Over Stuff, How to Live Free in a World that Wants to Clutter You Up. Genevieve has helped thousands of people live simpler, more joyful lives through her expertise, guidance, vlogs, and her website, Simple Living Toolkit. Genevieve also has over 70,000 followers on her Minimalist Living Facebook page. So I'm really looking forward to this because I am in need of the simple life mojo. <laughs> How about you, Maria? Yes, definitely. I'm in need too. But before we talk with Genevieve, I think our listeners would be interested to know that Genevieve's advice on minimalism has appeared in Elle Canada and Complete Wellbeing magazines. And she's also appeared on podcasts such as Organized Mindfully and Earthy, Echo Loving Adventure Travel. Together with her husband, Thomas, she wrote another Amazon bestseller, Simple Kitchen, The Essentials You Need to Cook Your Most Joyful Meals, which I love that book. She's an American who has visited over 40 of the states. She's currently living in Ukraine and has previously lived in the Middle East. As a moderate minimalist, she recently purchased a pair of slippers, bringing her total number of shoes to six pairs. <laughs> Kelly, what woman do you know that only owns six pairs of shoes? This is going to be fun. Mm -hmm. And I think everyone should know Genevieve is my daughter. I know her as Jenna, and I am so proud to, to know all of that she's accomplished. Absolutely, Maria. And of course, She's your daughter and she's my niece. So <laughs> we are really fortunate to have a celebrity family member with such great wisdom to share with our listeners. So Jenna, welcome to the show. Yes, Jenna, welcome. Hi, it's so good to be here. I'm so excited to talk to you and Kelly and mom. Thanks so much for having me. Well, we're delighted, of course. Yes. Um, and I think it's interesting to note that this show is being recorded in three different time zones. Kelly and I are in a different time zone, and Jenna, of course, is all the way over there in the Ukraine. So, But anyway, I, I, my first question for you, Jenna, is let's tell, can you please tell the listeners, tell us how you got into minimalism and simplifying your life and what benefits you saw? Well, this is something that was important in both of our lives, <laughs> Mom. <laughs> you remember when our house burned down. That's right. Um, so many years ago, I was traveling abroad in France for the summer. It was the summer after my freshman year of college. And I got a call. I was on the metro and I was partying. It was midnight in Paris. I was so happy. I was out with some other international students. And I got a call from my mom before this was before cell phone, everyone carried cell phones. So the group leader had a cell phone and somehow mom you got a hold of her she passed me mm -hmm. the phone i'm on the metro i'm like hey mom i'm so excited i'm on the metro in paris like this is my life right now and you said jenna are you sitting down and i sat down on the metro and you said <laughs> our house burned down everyone's okay 
even our dog is okay, Lando's okay, but our house burned down. And I was really surprised how happy you sounded because everyone was okay. And that was, that's obviously amazing news because it's a really big, scary thing. But you said most of our stuff is destroyed. The house is basically destroyed and between the smoke and the fire and the water, like it's pretty much all our stuff is gone. And so that was pretty life-changing because I just had what I had with me, um, what I had packed with me and everything else was gone. And I have to say that before that, I was a pack rat and mm -hmm. I kept everything. I was very, sent I'm still this way, actually. I'm very sentimental about every little thing and a huge collector. I had, I think I had 25 pairs of shoes at least. And so losing everything just gave me this perspective because I was so happy. We were really surprised at how joyful we were after that because everyone is okay. And it, and it really cemented the, le the lesson that relationships, that the people are the most important thing in life. And the stuff really doesn't matter that much. So that's how I became a minimalist. Yeah, and I, and I would add that of my four children, you were the one who loved things the most. I mean, you, not expensive things, but you would often go to the store and just buy, you just love little bottles of things and <laughs> and you wouldn't eat your Halloween candy. You just keep it for many, many months until it, was <laughs> until it wasn't good anymore. <laughs> So it's, it's, I, I find it, you know, marvelous and wonderful and miraculous that of my children, you're the one who is the expert on minimalism <laughs> and who has lived, lived a very minimalist life since then. Yes. And I, I you know, I, I, so, you know, of course, being Maria, your sister-in-law and friend and your aunt Genevieve, that when your all's house burned down, I, you know, when I heard you had a house fire. I'm thinking, you know, a kitchen fire and it maybe ruins your, you know, the hood over the stove. And then when I saw the pictures, it was unbelievable. And I think part of the story that why your mom was probably happy that everybody got out, the, the story of Lucia sleeping next to the wall that was flaming through the roof and dreaming that she was hot and things were crackling yeah. that she was so close to that fire yeah mm -hmm. and you know that 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 it was it engulfed the whole house i mean when, once i saw the pictures i'm like oh my gosh yeah everybody's out safely and that is amazing yeah but it was it was a huge emotional event in all of your lives and i can see that you know it, it definitely had this major imprint on your life so you know and I, and I love this the stories that we always hear is really terrible things that happen in people's lives can often have a silver lining so this was your silver lining absolutely and, and more than that I mean I think I I still can recapture the joy and relief that I felt so I think it wasn't just a silver lining it was an underline of our values so mine and I know Jenna's are the same of that, what we love are the people <laughs> yeah. and, and yeah. to have the, you know, to come close to losing the people that you love and I'm not losing them. I could, I, st I can still feel, remember the relief and the joy that we experienced. I know you felt that way too, Jenna. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. It's just interesting. Cause you would think that would be something that everyone that I would have known already, but there's mm -hmm. something about culture, our culture, especially American culture. It's really not so much of a problem outside the States, but something that is there that makes it hard to remember that. We really get a lot of messages that make us feel identified with our belongings. Like they reflect some something valuable about us or that we can increase our value by what we own. And it's clearly not true and also doesn't affect our happiness at all, but it feels like that and it's hard to stay connected to the truth. Yeah, so, so Jenna, you were kind enough and smart enough to send us F these five great tips. So you sent them to Maria and I a couple of days ago, and we've been looking at them and we're going to go over the five. So the number one, which related it, it, number one tip for our listeners is declutter your stuff. So you had this, you had an automatic decluttering of your stuff with a house fire. So people who don't have all their <laughs> stuff burned to the ground, how do our listeners who want to declutter or like me, how do we do it? 
Well, I use one of two methods. We call it blaze and gaze. And I also <laughs> want to just tell listeners that I know, Aunt Kelly, you're really good. You actually, I interviewed for you for my book, and I know that you're really good at purging and that you actually came up with the terms I use in my book. I use this term purgers and collectors. So I think first mm -hmm. you identify your own attitude towards stuff. And well, let me just rewind for a minute and say minimalism is about your stuff, but it's also about intentionally creating your whole life. So it applies to your stuff as well as your activities, your thoughts, your schedule, everything you can imagine. It's just, it's about intentional life creation by focusing on what is most important. So, so back to your stuff, I think you have to borrow from your amazing creation and identify if you're a purger or a collector. And it's pretty innate. It's a personality thing. And Aunt Kelly, I know you're really good at purging. Like you, you have no problem when it comes to your stuff. Maybe, maybe in other areas, your schedule or your activities or your thoughts there, you know, you can apply this stuff, but your homes are always immaculate, beautiful. They look simple. They're relaxing to be in because there's not a lot of clutter and knickknacks and extra stuff. And I think everyone just breathes a sigh of relief when they walk in. So if you're like that, you're probably okay with your stuff. But if you're like me and you're a collector, then you have to do these techniques, blaze or gaze or both. I, I usually use both. And so blazing is like, imagine a fire is in your, is going to burn your house down. And you just go, you imagine that for each area of your home and you just take out the things you absolutely love and would want to save in case of fire and you declutter the rest, you get rid of it. Recycle it, give it away, throw it away, sell it, whatever you need to do. And then gazing is for things like your important paperwork or your sentimental items where you do really, there are some really precious or important things in there worth holding on to. So you look at each item individually and you decide to keep it or not. But blazing is something people don't really talk about. It's kind of a little known secret to going fast when it comes to decluttering. Because the truth is, you don't always need to look at every single item you're get, you're giving away. As long as you know there's not import, the one exception is important paperwork or sentimental items because you really do want to look at each of those individually. So that's that's the technique I recommend to declutter your stuff. I really like I that. I love it. I, yeah, yeah. I, I love this concept because I think for those of us who are not purgers, those of us who are you know more collectors, or even I mean, of course it's a it's, it's a, lo a line and I'm probably somewhere in the middle, but, but it's, it's very difficult. Decision-making science is interesting. And what they've learned is that making decisions is tough. And so if you're looking at every little thing, it's exhausting to make all those decisions. So yes. when you make it, you know, having a house fire or having something big happen in your life really clarifies what your values are. And so the blazing thing sort of creates this artificial, uh, sense of, okay, something big has happened. Now, you know, I know what's important and you go right in there and get that. So I, I, I think that is unique to your system, Jenna, and I really, really like it. And I think it's really helpful. Very, very helpful. And I'll tell you a quick little story with the having a, a very uncluttered house. I'm married to a purger. So oh. we have to be careful that we don't end up in an empty house. <laughs> Two purgers I'm married to kidding. each other. Yeah, that's the minimalist dream. Yeah, uh, you, usually... Isn't it true that usually a purger and a collector are married yes. and then there's there's conflict? Yeah. Well, that's most of the advice that I Mark, get is, is like, it, help, my partner is not a minimalism. What do I do? Yeah. So we're both purgers. And I think you you and I also share this. We're very sensitive to our environments. And so I do feel, and I'm certified in feng shui, which is loves the uncluttered, which is maybe a different show. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I feel just more free, more open, more alive when I'm in a beautiful, clean space and not a cluttered space. So everybody knows, in fact, we just, our last podcast, we talked about this home that we built on the ocean that had two hurricanes hit it back to back in back to back hurricane seasons. And so obviously you have to have the insurance people come out and look at your house. And so they came out after the storm and the guy ends up, he walks through the whole house and he says, he brings Mark and I down. He says, we're not going to be able to cover this. And we're like, what? You know, this is, he said, well, this isn't your primary residence. You, you know, you obviously don't live here. And we said, no, we do live here. This is our primary residence. He's like, no, 
you, you there's not enough furnishings in there. This <laughs> you guys are realtors. This house is <laughs> staged and they're you know, you just you don't live here. And I said, wait a minute. I said, come here. So I took him in. I showed him our refrigerator, which was packed full of stuff, our pantry, which he didn't look in these places. Then I showed him, you know, our closets and we were there full time, but it was so funny. And of course he ended up realizing, you know, talk to the neighbors and obviously sometimes insurance companies will look for reasons to decline your claim, but he was going down the road of this was a vacation rental and we live somewhere else. And I'm like, well, where else do we live? (laughs) We didn't even, you know, now we spend the summer in the mountains, but we didn't have any other residents at that point. That was it. We only one, we owned one residence. So I just think that that was funny. And I love that story as far as a decluttered place. It really shows, it really proves, yeah, that you're two purgers married to each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are two purgers. So Jenna, so the second question I have for you to tie into your second tip is, and I'm going to just give the tip and then you can kind of explain it. You know that we talk with a lot of champions and you were a Taekwondo forms champion. I remember watching you win that gold medal and, um, you're also, you, you, you do swim well. You're, you're a great athlete. You run and, yeah, hey, you're a Parker, right? <laughs> so when we look at this second tip, which you say is to focus on your one thing and own the opportunity cost, uh, I think that can apply to athletics or to life. And can you explain that second tip and maybe how, what the benefits are of that? Yes. I think this has benefits to all areas, but especially to athletes, anyone trying to achieve a really specific goal in athletics. And and minimalism really is a great tool in your toolbox to help you with this. So just there's, you know, I know you have mentioned the book, The One Thing by Gary Keller before on this podcast. And I love that book. And I, I think it's an amazing minimalism book. And so that's just the... Everyone can, can do that, but I think it's, what I'm trying to say is it's very simple. You, it's a simple piece of advice. Focus on your one thing and do it. But what you're doing that's painful a little bit or, or a sacrifice is if you really focus on your one thing, you're saying no to a whole lot. That's the opportunity cost. Every decision we make, we, we're saying no to everything else. And I think it's easier if you face up to that and you take responsibility for the opportunity costs. So for example, um, I think of one of the most inspiring podcasts you, you did where you interviewed Louis Pugh and it was such a great, it was one of my favorite podcasts and I've listened to all the Champions Mojo podcasts up to this point. And you kind of asked him a lot of different questions and he talked about his one thing, which was swimming to save the oceans, to save the planet. And you asked him like what he does to relax and other questions. And he didn't have a lot to say. And, and he seemed very, very happy with it. It really struck me how he kept saying like, it's an honor and a privilege to do this. He said it over and over and over. And I think that's him really, really owning the opportunity cost and, and and saying, I've thought about all the other things I could be doing with my life. And I'm okay with saying no to all those other things. So minimalism is really editing. It's really saying no. And it's knowing what you're saying no to. And that's a really good way to reverse engineer getting to your life purpose. Well, am I okay with saying no to this, 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 and this? And if the answer is yes, then I think you can feel really peaceful and really calm about doing your one thing. And and you know that's the most powerful thing you can be doing right now in this moment. That's a really powerful, powerful concept that I have struggled with my whole life. (laughs) So I, I, and I think all the champions we've talked to have said, you have to have vision, you have to have purpose, you have to know what you're after. And I think if, you know, if you're, if you're going for Olympic gold in swimming, then, you know, other things have to, have to go away. Um, And I, I like the idea of owning the opportunity cost because you know, you, what are you saying no to? And are you willing to? Cause I think sometimes for me personally, I, you know, I can sort of lie to myself about, you know, what I'm willing to say no to. <laughs> so I, I, I think that's a very powerful 
Oh, I'll just give a personal example from my life. So I, you know, I, I've thought about my, my values over and over again. And I, you know, family is, is a very, very important value to me. And I want to have time to be with my family, to interact with them, to support them in any way that I can. But if I'm doing that, and if I'm truly doing that, um, then there are things that I'm not doing. And I thought about this last week because I also run a business <clears throat> and, and often it comes down to, am I going to, am I, am I going to do this for the business or am I going to do this for the family? And, you know, you just, you have to be willing to know what the most, the most important thing is for me. It's not the one thing I will never have the one thing. I will always have the five things, yeah. but I can, I can rank them and I, you know, and I can make a decision based on that. Yes. Yes. And I, I think it's obviously athletes do this really well, but I think people can apply this great tip to anything, not just athletics. I recently went to my high school annual reunion, the 10 year, not 10 year. I don't even want to say how many years it was, but it was, the, it was one of the decades. And um, <laughs> I re I reconnected with my best friend in high school. Of course, I haven't not been in touch with him in 30 wow. or 40 years, but my very best friend in high school who I palled around with, who we did everything together was a guy. Um, but I reconnected with him just recently. And he, he told me that he realized he was, he did a long military career. He realized that his GI bill is running out and he wants to go back to school and get uh, another master's degree. He already has one. And so he said, I am going to be so focused because it's going to run out in like 18 months. He said, for the next 18 months, all I'm going to be doing is being a student. And I think you can do the, you know, take that one thing, whether it's athletics or going, getting a degree or running a marathon or whatever it is. I think it, it, this is a great principle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I always look at it as outside of my relationships. So they're always important. The most important thing, my family and friends are always the most important thing, but so I don't apply it. I have like my one thing in my business in the other outside of like caring and loving and being and spending time with my family and friends, which is always for me, number one. Then I have like my one thing, like this quarter, my one thing is. Oh, I like that. So it's a sort of, it can be, and that's what you were suggesting too, Kelly. It's like, okay, so the one thing that, you know, is to get his master's degree in the next 18 months. The one thing for me this quarter is this, maybe next quarter it'll be something else. And that allows a little bit more, <laughs> more leeway great, in great. what I yeah. think is a very tough to me, very, very tough, but absolutely important aspect of li living the minimalist life. Great, great stuff. So Genevieve, what is number three and how uh, how can we apply that? Okay, number three is apply the Pareto principle, which is also known as the 80-20 rule. So a quick summary for any listeners who haven't heard of that is that uh, an Italian economist discovered this general principle that 80% that of your results come from 20% of your activities to get those results. So this is another way, I think this is another one that really applies to athletes, of course, anyone in any area, but it really, I think athletes have to, these days, take a lot of responsibility for their own training, physical training, mindset training, all the kinds of training. And I really hear that they're, they're really, on the podcast, I really hear that they're also now owning their careers and taking ownership of their social media and everything. So it's, it's consciously sitting down and writing down the activities you do, listing them out, boom, boom, boom. And then you say, what am I getting 80% of my results from? And you cross out the other activities and you do more of what's getting you your results. And you do this regularly once a year or once a month, whatever feels comfortable or whatever works for you, you experiment with this. And if you get good results, you keep doing it. So it's just really good to know that happens. I mean, in this, this percentage, this can you proportion give, can is Can repeated. you give an example? Wait, Jenna, wait, you... no, Maria, Maria, this what? is perfect for you to, to give an example of, <laughs> we just, our last podcast, you said you traveled 20 times in the last year. So this is exactly the 80, 20 rule. So yeah. let's do it on you, Maria. Okay. So all right. All right. Last, all right. So last I, year you traveled 20 I times. I left my home 20 times. Well, I will have. I've left my home so far 19 times in 2019 um, to do different things. So this, so if I apply the Pareto principle, I can look at those 
2019 trips and say, okay, which, which, what, five of them? Yeah, what's were, 20%, which 20% yeah. produced yeah, 80% which is, of your which results? Which five trips, right? Because if it's almost 20 trips, so... so no, that's 25%. But anyway, close enough. Close enough. <laughs> you know, what, what, you know, were the most effective and, and I guess moved me towards, towards my one thing. Yeah. Yes. yes. And then you can go back to those if they were the same conference or the same event or whatever. And then you can right. decide if you want, do something different with your time for the other ones. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's, that's hard. a great one. Those that I find, I find the opportunity cost, owning the opportunity cost and, and the, the 80, 20 rule hard because it requires, and this is, we did talk about this for our last, uh, our last, um, podcast that Kelly and I did just with one another, you know, I said that I was going to work more on reflection and both focusing on your one thing and the opportunity cost and applying the Pareto principle requires reflection. You have to stop. For me, you know, the minimalism I need is in my life activities, not in my stuff. And you have to stop and reflect and think about things and make plans in order to apply these two things. And and that's what I need more of, just, you know, making sure that I'm living the examined life and applying these these principles. They're great. Yeah, I think it's hard for me, too, to sit down and take time to reflect. We're both, Mom, you and I are both very future focused. We like to make plans and, and we're present mm-hmm. focused. We like to just be get stuff done and then plan this amazing future but like looking back and really examining what worked and what didn't is pretty hard for me too yeah yeah that's good okay so number four is let go of emotional baggage and increase lightheartedness you want to talk about that jenna yeah the last two are kind of more spiritual or symbolic um but they really are a big part of minimalism it's It's, for a lot of people, if we're taking it back to stuff, the hardest thing to declutter, and I pull my members of the Simple Living uh, Toolkit community when they sign up for my email list, I pull them and I say, what's hardest for you? And people say the hardest thing to declutter is sentimental items. And I think this goes for collectors in general. We have trouble letting things go. I have trouble letting things go. Like even when it just comes to, forgiving myself or forgiving others who have hurt me or letting go of a of a memory that maybe is bittersweet or maybe there's some negative feelings mixed in it can be attached to an item or you know sometimes there's like guilt or weirdness attached weird complex mixed feelings attached to something and letting that go can feel so good and so light and it makes you more lighthearted and people who are, feel more lighthearted can have more fun with life. And <clears throat> they've done studies that show like, if you laugh and have a sense of humor, you have increased creativity and problem solving. And I think that's really important for everyone, athletes included. And I don't know about the, I have this hunch that lightheartedness or humor or fun increases athletic endurance, but it's that I haven't seen a study about that. But in my life, I did this, my own personal little test. A while ago, I was doing a really intense workout where I was stair running, doing stairs, and I was timing myself on this long outdoor staircase. And I tried repeating different words because I'm I'm a mindset fanatic. Like I have a really vivid imagination and my mindset can really be for me or against me. And I tested all these words as I was doing the, the run. I think I first tested joy and then smile. And on, on my last one, I tested the word fun, which makes me feel really good. It has a really good fun energy for me. And that was my fastest one, even though it was the last one that I tested. I was able to go farther and faster. So I think that letting go of the heaviness of maybe someone hurt you or, or your, your items that feel you have guilt or bad feelings attached or forgiving yourself can light, lighten you and make you faster in so many ways. Hmm. That's a beautiful oh, Jenna, story. That is, yeah, that's fantastic. And I, I think it's it kind of ties into the Japanese water experiments, which we ta- we've talked about before. But I love that you were on your final set and you, and you were still getting better. And there's a, a saying, a uh, happy athlete is a, is a fast athlete. I think that, you know, I don't think it's been scientifically studied, but I love that you came upon that for sure. I, I, I love this idea. I, I just want to... The emotional baggage idea. When so when I had to 
to get rid of a bunch of stuff when we moved this year. And that we talked about this last time. It was so great to, to say goodbye to things. But I realized as I was going through, I guess I was using the gazing, not the blazing. I was going through like books and different things that each one of those things that I <clears throat> had given away, that I was going to give away represented a, a different Maria, a different person. Like for instance, I had a book on, <clears throat> excuse me, I had a book on, on, um, maybe, swimming or something, <laughs> you know, like, uh, and so, you know, I'm giving away this book because I am, I'm not going to devote my time to improving my swimming technique. That's, that's, you know, I'm giving away, I'm, I'm giving away alternate versions of the, of the future for me. It's like, okay, you know, I am having to say no to this. And, and when I did that, it was, it was hard to do, but then I felt so great because mm -hmm. I knew who I was. I wasn't all those other things. Oh, Yes. That's great, Maria. And and Jenna, you you actually gave me a great tool. Um, people can see it. I think you posted every 9-11 that I had this, this business suit that I was wearing when I was working in New York City and 9-11 happened and I had a lot of emotion tied to the suit and I was trying to clear out my closet and I, I just couldn't do anything with that suit. I kept looking at it and it had it just was electric with the emotion of being in 9-11 in New York City, and that's another entire podcast. But you told me, take a picture of it and write a story about it. And I always have that now, and I gave that suit away, and it really empowered me. So I know we're talking about emotional baggage, but yeah. there is emotional baggage tied to things. Absolutely. And things symbolize so I, I, things. Yeah, yes. Maria, and I hear what you're saying, because having I still have a little box of mom stuff, Grammy, your Grammy, Jenna, and your mother-in-law, Maria, and I still have a box of that stuff. And I think it's so emotionally tight. Like, I'm going to cry when I say this, and it may choke you up too, Jenna. I have her, her green glasses. Yeah. And I just see her wearing those in her flamboyant fashionista way, and I, I don't know what to do with them. Yeah. And then the beautiful scarf that you had given her as her last gift scarf that she draped on and then that covered the memorial podium when people were speaking about her. And I just, you know, I think I need to take pictures and write stories about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it's emotion is, it can be alone or it can be tied to an item. Yeah. And a lot of times it, this is very, a lot of people who reach out to me and write emails about this, they have lost someone. And I do just want to, if you're listening and that's you, like that, a lot of times people do end up having to declutter these items that belong to someone that they've lost and just be very gentle with yourself and take your time and you don't have to do it until you feel ready. And then what would you recommend that they do when they're ready to make it like easier or... Yeah, like you said, it's, uh, I call it digitizing and miniaturizing. Um, Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> you take a picture. I love your little terms. <laughs> You can write about it, just save it in digital form, and then you can look at it regularly. And you don't have to get rid of everything, you know, I mean, unless you want to, then you can, but then you have it. And you can also like, like I, in the, in my book, I give the example of like, if you have a picture of your mother on her wedding day, and then you have her old wedding veil that has a rip in it, you can cut out a little piece, make a miniature, you have a little wedding veil and you can frame it next to the picture of her. And that way it's in front of you. It's on your wall. It's there. You don't have to keep the whole wedding veil or the whole dress or the whole quilt. And I know you've done that too with quilts, with quilts that great mama made. So you've done the miniaturizing and making it into baby blankets that my babies have, my baby has and other babies have. I think you need to also be really aware of the feelings that your things uh, bring about and, and ask yourself, you know, why you're keeping them. Sometimes there's, there's guilt and bad feelings because you think you should have done something. Uh, right now I have, speaking of people who have died, I have jewelry from my sister who died. You know, every time I look at it, I, I feel bad. And I just finally put my finger on it <laughs> that, you know, I was intending to give that jewelry to her kids. And I, I haven't because I haven't really had the opportunity. And so that the guilt is really associated with my not, you know, having followed through on something that I said I would do. But I would just like, you know, close the lid on that box and just then, and, and, and the, and the, the bad feeling was still there, you know, I just shoved it down. So I think I love, I love the, 
digitizing and the processing is what you're talking about when you talk about writing, um, you know, or telling a story or, you know, it's, you have to, you know, when you have an, especially if you have a negative feeling, I think it, looking at it and processing it is a really important part of being truly free and minimalist in your life. Yeah. And I want to give one more really practical tip. I know people like really practical things too, because that's, that's, that's true. Um, but it reminded me of the treasure box idea. And it, it's not exactly, I'm not saying that like you need to keep all of Aunt Jenny's jewelry because I understand that it's mixed feelings for you. But for some people, this is a really practical thing that helps when they want to keep something and maybe open it once a year to feel the feelings, but not every day. Having mm -hmm. a boundary, like a set container, like this size box, this maybe this plastic bin that I can pick up um, you know, no more than 30 pounds or whatever. And then I'll every year at Christmas or on their birthday or whatever, I'm going to open it. And I'm talking about like one per family member. So like all your, your things related to everybody, like you have one box and, and you put things in there. And then when it's full, you don't make more, you might get rid of stuff and put new things in there, but it's like a time capsule. And that's really for things that make you feel good or that, that take you on a walk down memory lane that you want to walk. But it's something mm -hmm. that's, that I think is helpful. I hope mm, that's, that is practical. Yeah. I love the digitize and minimize. And, you know, when we're all talking about our, your Grammy and mom, uh, she had, I think we were up to 10,000 pictures <laughs> and we could not just throw away all her pictures. So we, we had them digitized and put on the cloud and literally threw away a minivan filled to the ceiling, all the, all the seats down, floor to ceiling. I dropped him at the digitizer and he said, what do you want me to do with them when we're done? <clears throat> I said, throw them away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Good job. And no one else, no one else in the family had the strength to do that. <laughs> yeah. Put yes. me the purger right I on the front line. Took a purger, line. married <laughs> to a purger. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, the last one. This is related. Because we don't want to keep you too, too long. What, yes. I was going to say it's related. So it's a really good, this is a it's related to the last one we talked about, and it's actually really related to um, the kind of emotional, spiritual element of, of the last one. So number five is let minimalism give you permission to pursue what you truly want wholeheartedly. And this is the most, the most woo <laughs> of all of them. And it's a really important part for me, minimalism. And for a lot of people, it's about permission. It's about permission to live a life that's, that's unique to you. That's maybe a little unconventional. And I think athletes kind of already are relating to this because when you're training for a big athletic event, you're doing weird things already, like going to bed really early and like taking ice baths. And I mean, all the weird things I mean, mom, I, like sleeping with a tent on your bed, you know, like all the things you've done to train <laughs> and you kind of have to not care what people think, but to get like really spiritual about this one, it's all that permission is for is the, the purpose of that is to up level. It's, we all want something. We're all going after the next, the next goal. And that's, beautiful desire is what drives us in life. And it's amazing to visualize this goal. And so there's some symbolic magic that happens. I've noticed when people let go of that, which does not serve them, they make a space for something better to come. So it's really about giving yourself permission to do the scary, to open your hands and like let go of maybe what's not serving you. Like the example that comes to mind for, I'm such a fan of the podcast that I Think of this athlete you interviewed and he had a coach tell him to change his stroke and he tried it and it took him a long time to realize that he should not have changed his stroke. Do you remember who that was? Jeff Cummings. Yes. Jeff Cummings. And, and maybe eventually he went back to the old way he was doing it. And that's kind of the thing that I'm talking about where it's really scary to like trust your instincts and let go of something that you realize is not serving you. But it does this on an energetic or spiritual level, it makes space for something better to come in and take you to the next level. Hmm. 
So it could be something from your past, like, you know, that you're holding on to. I love this concept of opening your hands and letting go um, to make space for what's what what you need now. That's beautiful. It's kind of like, yeah. And like, I, I think that's really powerful, Jenna. And we, you know, we openly talk on the podcast, as you know, about me suffering from anxiety on and off. And I, I feel like I can almost tie this to le- letting go or letting flow when anxiety hits me. That's emotional baggage. Yeah. That is the emotional baggage of what I'm, whatever I'm worried about. Is my breast cancer going to come back? Is my house going to get hit by a hurricane? All those things, you know, like we get mired down in. And I think by just letting that go, like, you know, instead of palpating my breast every single day, I'll do it once a month, like I'm supposed to, not every single day. Would that tie into that? Absolutely. Or is that just- this is the one where I think if you're listening, you know what it is for you. It's everyone knows what it is. Like it's what your instinct is telling you right now that you need to let go of. It's an act of faith and you let it go and you hope that, and you, it's, you're just leaping into the unknown, trusting that it will be replaced by, in your case, this peace and calm. Does that, and does it happen? Yes. Yeah. I, I, tr- I, when I, when I do that, when I just like, I will find whatever, some hypochondriacal thing on my body and, and I'll think, okay, I need to examine this. I need to examine it. I need to Google check it. And then I, I will just say, oh, just let it go. Just no, you are not allowed <laughs> to drill down on this and just move on with the next thing. And it really helps. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. The con- the uh, For me, the visual of just opening your hands. <laughs> and I had to do this this year with my uh, my mom and dad yeah who are well and healthy and who I have enjoyed living near for you know 20 years but then there was an opportunity and you know to to move closer to my kids and um it was you know really hard to do but I love the concept of you know it wasn't like I just left them out there I have siblings and other other family members who are more than able and desirous to to be with them and care, help care for them. But, um, yeah, it's, it's a really, it's a really beautiful concept, Jenna. Thank you. Oh yeah. Maria, I know this has been really emotional, emotionally draining on you to have left your parents and, but, but that this is perfect. So put them in that hand and just let it float away and know that your siblings are taking care of them and you're going to see them and they're going to be fine. Yeah, they are fine. They are fine. They're great. That's beautiful. That's so inspiring. That is beautiful. And you you both beautiful. are so be- inspiring to me. <sighs> oh, you are. You are to us, Genevieve. I mean, this has been this has been just fantastic. I know that anyone listening has gotten a ton out of it and I I'm just so so grateful that we had the time and I think that's a perfect place to end the show on um Maria talking about just opening the hands and letting those things go. So Uh, Genevieve, we know we've got to let you go. You have a tight schedule this morning and we're going to say goodbye. And Maria and I are going to roll right into our takeaways, which we love to do. We love talking with you, Jenna. I hope you have a great day. Thank you. I love you you both. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Love you too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. So Maria, I, you know, I I know I'm, I'm biased, but she was fantastic. Absolutely <laughs> yeah. just fantastic. I think I might even be more biased than you. Of course, she's yeah, amazing. I think, I think you might be. <laughs> uh, so um, so I want to start out with, like, my first takeaway that just really hit me is I love the there. I love every concept in here, but something that I'm going to come right out of the gate and do. I don't need to declutter. Being a perger, I'm no. pretty decluttered. You just end but up, I'm, yeah. I, yeah, I'm going to own the opportunity cost of really working on my goal of of making this podcast grow, so we can reach more people and help mo- more people and. What is, the, what is the opportunity cost, Kelly? The opportunity cost, which is what I was going to say, like initially it's a lot of time. You know, I spend a lot of time every single week 
that's unpaid time. I mm-hmm. mean, uh, people may think podcasters make money, but mm-hmm. for, uh, for the first two, three years, you don't make any. It's all outflow money, and you know that because mm-hmm. you're you're paying too. It's mm-hmm. but. I do spend a lot of time on everything from scripts to booking people to working on the website to, you know, all the things that anybody does with a hobby or a job. And I I just I feel sometimes like because I'm not earning money that I need to be doing it less, but I actually think I need to be doing it more. So I'm going to own the opportunity cost of right now we put in the time and I'm going to focus on this one thing. And I know that if I do that, it's going to flourish and continue to grow. And it is flourishing. I mean, what we just did a, our business perspective and our viewership is up 93% over the last six months. So it's amazing. Um, we're growing and we, we just had a beautiful shout out from Swimming World Magazine and they posted our interview with Cody Miller. And so we are absolutely, and you and I are going to the International Swimming League Pro, they've reached they've reached out to us. So we're absolutely growing. But you know me, I'm rather impatient. And so I, I just want to own the opportunity cost of building this this beautiful product that you and I are doing mm-hmm. and and not feel bad about it. Hmm. So the, so the that's really that's really great. I love that because it is whenever you build anything, it's it's brick by brick. And so when you first start something, there's a lot of there's a lot of energy around it and creativity. And then, you know, we're now what, 10 months into it. And and now it's just, you know, continuing to to work at it. So I, I, I love that for you, Kelly, because I know that's something that that is hard <laughs> for you to because you you know you're used to working hard and making money and 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 being successful so to put continuing to put the bricks in the foundation and the walls of this beautiful thing that you're building you know and and owning that it's going to take you time and money is 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 great i love that that we're building maria yes. we're building yes, yes. <laughs> yeah so, so for, what about you yeah for me the there's you know there's so much good stuff here my decluttering is always i'm i'm not a purger um in general, but I don't have trouble letting things go ever. Um, so it's just a matter of discipline for me to, to do it occasionally, but, uh, I'm not a, a, not a, a, you don't have a lot of stuff or have any trouble letting go stuff, but I have trouble letting go of ideas of, of, uh, commitments, I guess I would say that's probably it. So I think, I mean, I, I I have to also go with, with, um, well, all of them really, (laughs) but my, my take home is, is owning that it's going to be painful to let things go, especially commitments. I'm, I'm a person who, who really, 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 as you know, like to a fault loves to keep her commitments and, um, but life, you know, we grow, we change and life changes and, I have to allow myself to let prior commitments go so that I can move on to new and exciting opportunities like this podcast. So, um, so I guess for me, number four, maybe I'm going to work on letting go of the emotional baggage that I have associated with, with being, you know, committing to something, um, and allow myself to, you know, joyfully and lightheartedly go after, new things to, 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 to change. I'm going to allow myself to change. Um, and I that's... love that Maria. And I, I'm, I'm thinking back to, I think it was like our third podcast because I, I remember it clearly because I was in Southern California. We were visiting Mark's family in the San Diego area and we were recording there and we had this conversation about you're over committing to things. And mm-hmm. I think we were actually talking about saying no to things. And yeah. so I, I see as your, you know, sister here that your emotional baggage, if I'm helping you is your emotional baggage is not being able to say no to everything that people ask you to do. Yeah. That's part of and it. And so I love that you're, you know, you're still working on that and that that's putting that in your hand. And, and, and I, I love that we came up with the term of, Hey, maybe somebody is going to do this better, right? Better. 
that, that I could do. And that, right. that, that was when, when I let go of being the president of ITSAN, which is the charity that I started, which I'm still involved with and raise money for, but I was the president for five years. And I, I thought I co-founded this organization and I just can't, I just can't step down as president, but I needed to because right. it was, it was cluttering. And oh my gosh, the presidents that came in after me were now, it's now 10 years in and there are two presidents that have been, they were so much better than I was. Mm. I mean, it was like, oh my gosh, just let it go. Yeah. So yeah, I bet. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's, I've started things and, um, and, 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 you know, that doesn't always happen. Sometimes if you leave something, it, it crashes and burns and you have to be, you know, you have to be willing to, to watch that happen too, but that's okay. What I, what I, yeah. What I have to do is just give myself permission to not keep every single plate I've ever started spinning, spinning. <laughs> Gosh, what a beautiful image. I, lo- I love it. Yeah. That's, that's Some of those totally... plates are going to fall. And then I just, yes. you know, got to keep my three main plates spinning. <laughs> Yeah. And I think my second takeaway, which we probably are going to share, I, I really am going to look back on the year, sit down with a list and say, what all this activity, what produced, what 20% of this activity that I just did produced 80% of my results. Mm-hmm. And I think that's my second takeaway. I do. Takeaway. Absolutely. We'll do that. I, that, you know, that, that's such a good, it's such a good rule and so important for me to, to spend time reflecting in that way so that I, Yeah. So that we, you know, we're investing in the things that make sense. That's great. Yay. Well, there is another great show, a great way to head into the new year. I know this is going to launch on December 31st. We are so grateful that you guys have spent this year with us and we are so looking forward to 2020. We're going to crank this show up and give you awesome content so that you can just take your life to the next level and yes. champion your own life. Maria, what, what do you want to say to our yeah, listeners here just at the thank end of you the for year? joining us. Uh, I, I agree with Kelly and walking with us on this. I think I've, I have changed a lot in these last, in this last, in 2019. And, and a lot of the, a lot of it's come from lis- listening in, to you and talking with the champions that we've talked to. So I, I just, but I'm also so grateful that there are people out there listening who are walking with us and, and, and making changes in their lives too. So thank you so much for that. Yes. So we wish everybody a totally blessed and happy and prosperous, wonderful, healthy new year. And we look forward to seeing you next, hearing you, being with you next year. 2020. 2020. All right. All right. Love you, Maria. Love you, Kelly. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This week's quote of the week comes to us from Genevieve Parker Hill. Letting go of items or memories connected to bad emotions can make you more lighthearted and make you feel better. We are so grateful that you spent this time with us today, and we hope that you heard something that inspired, motivated, and educated you. Please see below for our copy of the show notes for any links or important information referenced here. Signing off for myself and champion co-host Kelly Palace, we hope you'll join us again soon, and we know you can be a champion. Thank you for listening. You've been listening to the Champions Mojo podcast, designed to make you feel inspired, motivated, and educated. Subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Play. Also, visit championsmojo.com to learn more.